they pretended that they were on space odysseys, places that transcended his, his isolator. And they had many great adventures where they explored other planets in which he got to be a swashbuckling space captain. Night after night, we would make all these trips all through the universe. He was the pilot and I was his co-pilot. And he would always protect me and bring me back safe. In 1975, David's space fantasies came a step closer when NASA helped find a solution to his extreme confinement. After more than two years of development and at a cost of $50,000, the public was presented with another spectacular triumph for science. The mobile unit has given David the chance to explore the outside world, and in a recent outing, he playfully sprayed his mother with a garden hose. A specially designed suit allows him to experience the world. The ever-smiling, effervescent youngster took his first walk in the outside world. He watered the yard and played with the family dogs. This is a PR dream, but David, behind the cameras, where no one can see, is very afraid of getting in that spacesuit. You know, he wanted out, but yet he was scared to death that the germs would come in. I mean, the world is full of germs. The fear he had, I mean, that fear was instilled in him from day one. After only six walks, David refused to get back in the spacesuit. It was disappointing. It was very disappointing. What's your hopes for him? Well, we're very optimistic about David's problem with all his genius doctors working on his case all over the world. We truly believe that one day, soon, David will be able to come out. Everyone involved in David's care has felt trapped by the situation at one time or another because we do feel that uh, it's, a, it's a problem that we can't just turn off and walk away from. But inevitably, the team responsible for David's situation did move on. Dr. South was the first to go. My reasoning was I would not leave in spirit. The work is going to go on. I've done what I can do for David. Jack Montgomery left two years later. I was not contributing in any way to the solution of David's problem. I was just keeping things going. Then, in the spring of 1976, shortly before David turned five, Raphael Wilson suffered a major heart attack. David was taken to the ward to visit him. The nurses wheeled his isolator into my room. David took one look at me and started to scream. His worst fears were coming to light. Something could happen to me so that I wouldn't be able to take care of him. But once Raphael Wilson had recovered, he gave David the news he had been dreading. Wilson would be leaving Houston too. The three people who are to keep him alive are no longer on his case. David understood that his life depended on those individuals finding him a cure. And when each of those individuals, from his perspective, abandons him, he must have understood that his future took a turn for the worst. He had no choices, and, and his hormones were kicking in, and he felt that everybody was deserting him, which in reality they pretty much were. Here he was inside of the system, Something obviously had to be done. It just seemed to be going on and on and on. And one had to say, when is this going to stop? In the autumn of 1978, immunologist William Shearer was put in charge of David's case. Dr. Shearer saw David with a fresh vision. He was in no sense hostage 
to the original set of attitudes and hopes, you know, that put David in that isolator. What he saw, quite simply, was a failed experiment. My feelings were to advise the parents of the options and to really draw a focus to a decision. Shearer had David examined by a team of psychiatrists. Their report was unequivocal. David's mental state would deteriorate as long as he remained in the bubble. I have shared the preliminary findings with the vetters that David has extraordinary fears and anxieties. My recommendation to Mr. and Mrs. Vetter was that David be removed from the isolator system. The vetters appeared to be shaken by this discussion. I remember the conversation, and he was, he was very blunt. It was suggested that David be removed from the bubble and then just be treated accordingly. Well, I knew that that was a certain death. The vetters turned to David's original doctors for advice. All three were outraged when they heard of Shearer's plan. None of the three of us were going to just sit by and let this happen. We assured them that nobody could take David out of the isolator until they consented. In the spring of 1981, when David was nine, Shearer discharged him and the bubble was moved permanently into his parents' home. For a while, David's mood lightened, but it wasn't long before his mother noticed a downturn. I think for us, the summers were especially hard. I would notice that David would spend a lot of time gazing outside and he would see young boys on bicycles or he would see kids tumbling in the grass. I sensed uh, sadness to him. The time was coming soon where, you know, something would have to be done. Then, just as the situation seemed hopeless, came news of the long sought after breakthrough. A team of Boston researchers announced that they had developed a way to safely transplant incompatible bone marrow. The new procedure offered hope that Catherine's bone marrow could finally be used to kickstart David's immune system. I can remember being at the Society for Pediatric Research, and uh, there was a paper by this group in Boston that had developed this technique, and um, it was just marvelous. It sounded great, and Bill Shearer was there. And afterwards, he went up to talk. The procedure is experimental. It has not been proven to be efficacious. But after nothing on the radar screen, this is the first bleep of hope. I thought, oh, goody, oh, goody. When we talked it over with David, he just said, yep, he wanted to do it. It was a chance. If it didn't work, he would still be okay. David knew that. That's how we explained it to him. That's how science explained it to us. In the early hours of October the 21st, 1984, Dr. Shearer transfused two ounces of Catherine's bone marrow into David's body. We did fantasize. We did think about how all of that was behind us and how exuberant we were going to be when we could touch David for the very first time. Hello, everybody. For 12 years, we've known the youngster simply as David the Bubble Boy. But early this morning, doctors operated on David. And our medical reporter, Christy Myers, is with us now with the good news that this operation may mean that David someday can leave that bubble. The tone was very optimistic. Everything seems to be going well. You know, you sort of went around with your fingers crossed saying, no news is good news. And then came the bad news.
It was New Year's Eve when I took his temperature and it seemed elevated. I called the hospital and I said, you know, something strange. David has a little temperature. I went, flew back to Houston. He was in the hospital and I went to see him. As soon as I saw him, I knew something was wrong, you know. First of all, I didn't get a greeting from him. He was very sullen and uh, uh, I, I didn't get much out of him at all. I said, David, what's the matter? Nothing, no. Well, then my heart sank. I knew it. There was nothing we could do about it. 